Hi, I'm Bella Katz, Commercial Business Advisor for the Australia Pacific region of New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. I spoke with two of our uh, Beachhead advisors on the 6th of April, Christine Proctor and David Ginsberg, both based here in Melbourne, both seasoned professionals in Australian and global retail. Christine has a wealth of knowledge across customer experience and marketing, having held senior roles at Westfield, Pepcor, Steinhoff and Kathmandu. She was also instrumental in bringing Debenhams across from the UK. David brings multinational global retail experience, having led retailers such as 7-Eleven, Shell, Macro Whole Foods, Australian Pharmaceutical uh, Industries, as head of buying for Priceline. We talked about the Australian retail mood due to COVID-19, at times a strange and mixed response that leaves retailers and customers uncertain of what's open, what's available, and just really what's next. And here's what they had to say. I think one thing that's been very apparent here compared to New Zealand is that the government have been really setting a mindset around up to six months for these arrangements to be in place. So that's been a known indicator in the communications for the last few weeks. So I think it's really forced and challenged a lot of the thinking about how to chase opportunities, knowing that we're in a sort of a medium term play here. I was listening to Naomi Simpson speak last week and she talked about a multi-speed economy at the moment and I think that's definitely what we're seeing. So from a fashion and apparel and what I would say is discretionary retail perspective, then some businesses have um, really come to a standstill, particularly if they have been operating a very significant bricks and mortar shop front network, potentially with limited online. Um, others have been able to really drive their online um, and been very active in that space. And then others are seeing sort of quite unusual uplifts. So if you're selling active wear, if you're selling lounge wear, if you're selling exercise equipment and so forth, that's all absolutely flying at the moment. Um, but for others, the really discretionary um, areas have pretty much dropped significantly 70 to 80 percent for some of those retailers that whole health and wellness category was already mm. on the rise especially where it came to natural health and yeah, sure. those, those authentic natural businesses that that's likely to just continue and get stronger isn't it the pharmacy sector is is going very well here at the moment driven by um medications and uh, think categories such as vitamins minerals and supplements um and, and health and wellness orientated components of their offer. Um, the beauty sector, not so much. You know, so I don't think people at a discretionary spend around beauty products um, seems to have come off, but um, you know, in pharmacies, the other, other categories are offset in that, but certainly the trend and the focus around wellness, sustainability linked to wellness, whether it's packaging, um, uh, vegan um, uh, products that are, are better for the environment, less chemicals. I've seen a number of florists, for example, start carrying fresh fruit and vegetables and doing home deliveries. That enables them to actually um, access that sort of market trading environment that they're so used to being in, but actually delivering a new definition of freshness um, for customers, but also that home delivery that people might be used to with flowers. Um, Mecca Cosmetica, I think, have done a great job. They've been able to deploy their virtual assistants online, so you can now book in and get a cosmetic or a skin consultation with them directly, which I think is a fantastic example. Um, and I think within the restaurant environment, um, Really significant changes immediately switching to takeaway, but also building out that sort of provador offer. So they've been able to prepare um, take home meals and some of the stock that they may well have had, be it pasta, um, passata, all sorts of things, they've been able to turn. Um, their space into a type of a provador environment where that they can actually fulfill um, food to take away but food that can be prepared from home as well. People are hunting for adjacencies. Mm -hmm. They know their core business and they know their core customers and they're really looking for ways to uh, not necessarily completely do something new but actually look at how they can do something in a new way. I've been working with a, a group of small businesses just from an advisory point of view and they're using this time to start to think about um, 
what can they do? Um, one, if it's not to grow, physically grow some business right now, it's about how do they work on their business to ensure that it can survive, but also then come out of this in a positive way and prosper. And that might be things like looking at their current database and, and, and connecting them with their current customer base and really um, communicating with them and engaging them in a different way than maybe what they have. It's starting to think about um, their business, their offer and what that might look like look like going forward to start to invest time and um, not necessarily financial resources, but time and effort into developing and exploring and brainstorming new business ventures using their current business as a foundation, but with customers and uh, a database that they may have and, and, and engage that current database. So it's starting to pivot and think about what they have today and how that's going to look in the future and invest in the time in that. And I think those are really important um, um, initiatives and, and, and uh, activities to engage in right now. As a retailer, I'd be thinking ahead about what the future shopping experience looks like. Testers, for example, you know, like cos uh, perfume or mm. skincare uh, testers um, that today, you know, just everyone picks up and uses. That would change the way products, uh, customers engage with products for sure. Yeah. There are these new cues and new habits that we will all be forming over the mm. months to come. And I think we will see a very um, interesting evolution of the, the broader retail environment. I think the support for local businesses and neighbourhoods and our neighbourhood precincts will um, heighten in value. And I think there will be a, um, a natural attrition of some of the brands and the shopping centres. Possibly just an escalated change, um, not necessarily solely related to where we are now. But I think those cues around engagement and service and what it is that we want from an in-person shopping environment will become more of a consideration and the value of some of that will be amplified because people still want connection. Mm. Um, but also on the flip side, their new habits are they know how easy it is to get it delivered contactless at their front door, but they're home to get it now and they won't necessarily be home to get it again in the future. So I think I started off by saying week by week this is going to change and I think that's going to continue to be the case for a long time. Thanks for those great insights, Christine and David. We really appreciate them. Um, the rapid changes are proving challenging for many and it's clear that discretionary retail has dropped off significantly and led to store closures. Some, sadly, will be permanent. But there are winners and adapters too, and we've seen categories experiencing shifts and peaks, such as loungewear, exercise equipment, wine, sections of health and wellness are really booming. Other sectors are pivoting, mixing up their offerings. Many are turning to digital commerce as a way to continue serving their customers. You have florists selling fresh fruit and vegetables, re restaurants offering take-home uh, meals, and cosmetics retailers providing online consultations. It really is survival of the fittest and most adaptable. Uh, we'll be doing regular updates, so look out for our next video shortly.